Okay, and the next session that we're going to touch on is something that is actually very close to my heart as a personal veteran of the hospitality industry and someone who very much enjoys dining out. Next up, we'll be looking at maximizing the value of real estate with the F&B and hospitality sector. And here to host, we have the Head of Tourism for Hospitality for Invest Hong Kong, Cindy Wong. Please welcome Cindy. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me right? Um, thank you so much for joining us for this session. I'm Cindy, uh, the Head of Tourism and Hospitality uh, for Invest Hong Kong. A little bit of advertising. Actually, we bring in a lot of food companies and later I hope yeah, we can bring back more tourism uh, and travel agents companies back to Hong Kong. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, today. Uh, actually, we have one guest joining us virtually from Singapore, Mr. Jerome Ong from Fresh Lane, uh, Hong Kong. Thank you, Cindy. Hi, guys. Nice to see you guys on Zoom. A little bit of introduction. Jerome Ong is an investment professional and operator with significant experience in startups and growth companies. He has helped launch and scale businesses across Singapore, Tokyo, Taipei, and Seoul. Jerome currently serves as the general manager of Fresh Lane in Hong Kong, a dark kitchen platform, helping restaurants scale, operate efficiently, and future-proof their business in the food delivery space. Prior to Fresh Lane, he spent time in firms such as uh, Uber, GIC, and Goldman Sachs. And then uh, we have Basically, we have Jessica Farm, it's Jessica Farm, the founder and CEO of Common Farms. <laughs> Common Farms was founded on the belief that Hong Kong should seek to be independent towards locally produced food supply. Jessica's earlier career in the F&B industry opened her eyes to the city amount of waste generator from fresh food going bad in transit and a huge amount of carbon generated on an annual basis. Common Farms is targeting reductions across the board in food waste, pollution and water usage in production and the business is focusing on upscaling to make high quality, nutrient-dense fresh food accessible to wider uh, Hong Kong. And the third, we have last but not least, Mr. Matt Reed, co-founder of King Food Halls. Just next door, I just have my lunch over there. I have my favorite Taiwanese beef noodle. Well done. <laughs> and also my testament tea. Uh, Matt Reed is an entrepreneur and co-founder of Steelhead Group, which includes Massimo Concepts, King Food Halls, a fan of productions, plastic conscious, and disruption labs with longtime business partner, Malcolm Wood. A business spread across four primary verticals, hospitality, environmental, wellness, and content production. Each business draws from the other, all grounded in core areas of passion and disruptive ideas, harnessing creativity, innovation, powerful content, branding, strategy, and of course, design. So, um, it's very hard to imagine, you know, what are they exactly doing? Like your room is fresh lane, it's a like cloud kitchen, dark kitchen, how dark it is. And then Jessica, vertical farming, how to grow it, you know, vertically. Suppose, you know, farming should be horizontally. And then for Matt, kin. <laughs> what exactly is a kin for hall? You know, when the first time I met you, when you're telling me, you know, the idea, I really can cannot imagine. It's so massive so beautifully done and uh, it can also help our earth and hong kong let me uh, show you the videos first one by one and then we will continue with our session the video please <laughs> Freshly is a dark kitchen concept which allows food delivery focused restaurants set up their business more efficiently and faster with also less upfront capital. We provide the infrastructure from the kitchen space and all the way to the back-end technology that runs the kitchen. Our business started before the pandemic, but I think when the pandemic was at peak, people started looking at online food ordering more. Hong Kong has been on our radar for a long time and there is an immense opportunity in Hong Kong. It's a highly densely populated city and we believe that there is the opportunity to serve local residents with more food variety and an option of choices through food delivery. 
we have all the basic infrastructure set up and ready for their use. So this includes the kitchen infrastructure, but also all the backend ancillary services that we provide as a business. This includes you know, painful things like pest control, cleaning, garbage disposal. We actually centralize all of these and make sure that the restaurant and the business owner can focus on their cooking and do what they do best, which is to serve their food to their customers. Come into a freshly location as a takeaway customer, what you'll see is the rows of locker systems that we have in place, as well as the display system that tells the drivers when their order is ready and which locker they are in. Setting up the business entity was a pretty easy process in Hong Kong. People were open to exploring, listening, and um, also checking out new business ideas and models to see what would fit their needs. We operate on a food factory license for our entire facility as a whole, and operators can come in using our food factory license to operate their own business. Angus and Mimi from Bee Dragon has a very interesting story. They actually operate one of the wholesale seafood centers across our location in Fresh Lane, Saingpun. When they saw the site was being built, I think they had this idea that they could also venture into the D2C market and serve their food directly to consumers. Imelda from Meran Lang, she started off as a social media chef. She built a following on a social media platform, Instagram mainly. Her food was very well received and people started to want to order from her. We do think that Hong Kong has been very friendly to new business models and you know, all kinds of startups, including ours. As of today, we are more than 90% full in two of our sites. We have a third one that's in the works that will be launched sometime in Q1 or Q2 this year. And we are also at the moment looking for more sites, not just in Hong Kong Island, but across Kowloon and also new territories. Super Pump to us means having a best vision and an optimistic view of the world around us and the people around us and doing our best to make sure that we deliver on that vision. It's about 8,500 square feet and we take underutilized industrial space and turn them into control environment for growing edible plants. Behind me here is one of the ways of how we grow um, our edible flowers and herbs and microgreens. We use um, insulation to create a controlled environment to grow and we service the FMB industry, the hospitality industry in Hong Kong. We're growing about 30 different crop types. This is another one of our grow rooms where we are doing it with our 2.0 system where these shelves are actually movable um, to maximize the space usage. Being a startup in Hong Kong, it's critical for us to maximize the usage of space, particularly when cost is so high. We've been very methodical about where, where we're going to be located, what kind of space we're using, and how can we find the best options of space in Hong Kong um, for indoor growing. When we first started looking for the right space, it was very critical when, to think about what was the accessible infrastructures that we have. So in terms of the water, in terms of the electricity, and the great thing about Hong Kong is we have a lot of access to industrial space that are quite well fitted for our needs, including this one here in Yao Chang. This actually used to be a central kitchen for a restaurant group where we have taken it and turned it into a farm space. So this in about a week, we will be filling it with um, new plants um, to service our customers. There's no denying that the food industry has been a big contributor to climate change over the years. This is clearly seen in the industrialization of food production, extensive deforestation, and the day-to-day -day consumer reliance on plastic packed food delivered on a moped. Our system is broken and in a downward spiral. We asked ourselves the question, if you started a city today, how would you structure it differently in terms of food? Our mission is to produce a million meals a year. Meals that are high quality, use regenerative ingredients, and at a fair price for everyone. At Kin, we're driven to change the way we eat through technology, enabling whole districts to shift to regenerative agriculture and carbon-free delivery at no extra cost. To be successful, we need to offer our customers better convenience, more access to great food, 
and an easier journey than currently exists. Kin does exactly this. Our app curates some of the most exciting chefs and restaurants from all around Asia, compiled into easy food playlists, produced by Kin in our green kitchens, meeting our ingredient charter, which ensures a local, regenerative, sustainable, and carbon conscious supply chain. Food is emotion. The way it pulls on your senses, it has the ability to create memories. It makes you feel. It brings people together. Your kin. This paired with the benefits of technology can help change the way we eat. One meal at a time. Nice videos. Um, so maybe ladies first. Um, may I ask Jessica? Um, so you briefly mentioned about the mission. Can you further elaborate, you know, the mission of the common farms? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so maybe a little bit on the background side. I came from the hospitality industry and the F&B side. And prior to that, I didn't realize how much wastage was coming from the, the supply chain especially when we import 99% of the food that we consume in Hong Kong. And a lot of it has to do with the lack of production in Hong Kong because of just competition of space. And so in the process of you know, working in the F&B industry, that's what I learned. And then it was Common Farms came about as a solution for our restaurant group. Um, I was just thinking, can we produce better quality here at a more um, controllable price point because when you're importing food, fr especially fresh food, prices fluctuate, mm. not on like an annual base, it's on a weekly base. And I didn't realize that until I got in industry. And for a restaurant operator, and Matt definitely knows this, you can't operate with prices that continue to fluctuate on a daily basis. So um, the mission is to pro produce quality food locally. Um, in a sustainable manner. So we still use a soil base to grow our food um, and to reduce the wastage for our customers um, while we do the production locally in Hong Kong. And what that does is it reduces the waste, it controls the pricing better, and we're able to respond to the customer's needs faster because in a place like Hong Kong, people, the way they consume is very different, changes every day when we have so much options, mm -hmm. and we need to support our customers, which are the chefs and restaurants, to be able to do that. So growing it locally, um, growing produce that can really benefit from the um, production and the consumption proximity, um, and that's what we're doing right now. That's great. And uh, Matt, <coughs> I think uh, in your video, you mentioned your mission already. Since you launched uh, Kin just recently, for a few months, um, how far you know do you think you can arrange, uh, you can achieve that you know for the mission that you want to pursue? Um, well, uh, our mission is uh, to create technologies to change the way we eat, mm -hmm. and so um, technology is a perpetual journey of development. Um, but we are very much already onto that mission, mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, the traditional economics of a restaurant is normally uh, your two major costs will be your food costs, your staff costs, and hopefully not your rent. Um, uh, and uh, in a prop tech environment, uh, um, and and so if we can we are drive real food, we are not living in a metaverse. Yes. <laughs> so 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 what we are trying to do is build a full tech stack to reduce costs and increase revenue. And when we do that, it then enables us to change the way we eat. And we're translating that to be able to acquire regenerative ingredients. And, and that's the goal. And so in answer, we are just four months in. But uh, I can tell you already that we have been buying over four tons of beef a month that it comes from Australian organic co-ops that does not contribute to deforestation, that does not um, have a direct impact to climate change, which is the closest uh, continent with uh, beef cattle that meets our standards. Um, so we're already on the first stepping stone to our mission, yeah. That's great. Jerome, um, the video, I think we took it like uh, last year. I'm sure you have some update from us, you know, for us, right? Uh -huh. How many outlets you have now? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so right now we are operational in four outlets. Um, Sai Pun, one Jai, uh, one in Chun Wan, and then one more in North Point. Uh, we are currently constructing our fifth location, which is in Mong Kok as well, and then we're still looking for more. Um, yeah, I think just to touch on a little bit about like what Matt said as well, uh, you know, and, and the mission since uh, both other parties are sharing this. So ours is more infrastructure for better food. And I think the way we think about it is infrastructure for food comes in, in many different ways, right? So the sustainable sustainability angle is one of them as well. But I think, you know, we also operate on the slogan of we serve those who serve others. And I think, you know, all those who have uh, looked at this hospitality industry will know that it's not a easy industry to be in. Um, and particularly as well, you know, when, when you talk about the main bulk of your customers who are the day to day and you always hear the customer is king, right, in the retail and hospitality space. Um, you know, how do we kind of provide that level of service and, you know, help these entrepreneurs as well as you know, different restaurants and hospitality groups um, become more efficient, uh, become more technology savvy and also help them you know, grow their business in a sustainable way. Right? So I think this is what we, we look at on a day to day basis. And uh, since, you know, uh, all three panelists, actually, you have some technology driven, you know, uh, a system in place, uh, food tech, agri tech, and also prop tech already. So can you tell us a little bit of, you know, what exactly is the technology that, that, you, that you are using, you know, for your business? Uh, Jessica? Yeah, so when we're growing in a climate control indoor space, a lot of it has to be controlling the climate. So the first thing we need to do is assess the space. So what does the climate um, temperature, humidity look like? Um, and then we start incorporating different um, HVAC technology that would go into it. So very simply, um, when we were in our old farm, 1,600 square feet, we didn't have insulation. Once How big is the existing one? Is it 10 times? It's <laughs> 8,500. Oh, okay, five times already. Yeah. Mm. But um, the productivity is going to 10x because now we have learned from our old space and we've incorporated things to be um, maximizing the space use and the productivity in terms of the yield. So, um, you know, inverter system for AC. And then how do we make sure we calibrate the, the electricity usage in different times of the day? Um, and so a lot of it has to do with the climate control um, in terms of the technology that we're using. And then on top of it, the traceability element in, you know, what seed we use, who's the supplier all the way until who actually gets the final produce um, and being able to trace the quality and the time frame of it in a consistent manner. Okay, how about you, Matt? So our, our basis of technology is to build the whole ecosystem, the, the, in essence, the brain of the operation. So um, the consumer sees uh, our own ordering system, and that gives us then our own data, our own CRM, our ability to do variable discounting, which I think is actually incredibly powerful. So if you pre-order, it's cheaper. It, if, you, if you order at certain times, it will be cheaper, and this enables us to increase the curve of revenue. Um, and then when you dial back from the consumer, that's, that, that order is then coming into a fully built ERP system. So our kitchen runs in the same way as a factory. So every recipe is a build of materials. We know exactly our inventory. We know our, our production time. An order is opened on a screen and finished on a screen. So we, that, we run the kin factor on a dish, which is not just how well does it sell, but it's, it's it complying the how much space does it use, how much power does it use, how much time does it use. And sometimes a dish that may not sell that well has a high kin factor because it has all these other benefits that can be put together as a combined piece. Uh, and then that then automatically feeds into um, our accounting system, will then all speak to each other. So in other words, we could have 10 kins and decide to change from 220 to 250 grams of rice in one recipe, and automatically everywhere would change. The ordering would change, everything would update, the recipe would change, the recipe inside the app that the consumer sees would change from one button. Um, and through doing that, the efficiencies that, that creates is consistency of product, reduction of costs, increase in revenue. Interesting. Um, Jerome, how about you? It's mainly um, takeaway and ordering, right? Yeah. So actually, it's, it's, it's both of what the other panelists have mentioned. Uh, so the way we think about infrastructure for better food, right, again, it's actually two parts. Uh, one is the hardware infrastructure that we provide to, to restaurants uh, who operate in our environment. 
um, so that then you're talking about you know HVAC, MEV. Um, you know, we are running experiments with self-regulated hoods. Um, how do you make the mechanical and you know, exhaust system a little bit more, a lot more efficient, right? I think for those restaurants. So through that as well, um, it's not only saving on their upfront as well as operating costs, but at the same time, you know, how do you reduce the electrical requirements, power usage on a month-to-month -month basis as well for, for them? Um, so I think this is a conversation that we have with a lot of these, uh, sometimes the larger restaurant groups, right? Because they are used to working in larger spaces, number one, um, and having, you know, the most premium type of fit out available. But, you know, we, we have that conversation with them, um, you know, try to understand what is actually required. And then we kind of run our experiments with our in-house team um, to build uh, something that is spec a little bit differently, um, a lot more cost efficient, um, and to have that technology layer again, you know, where we look at the data, evaluate, you know, how much they actually require versus how much they actually use. And we kind of help them, you know, forecast future usage as well and for the build of our sites. Uh, the other part is the software infrastructure again. Um, I think, again, you know, if you look at the hospitality and, and F&B industry, a lot of these uh, backend services are, are very, very fragmented, right? From POS systems, payment providers, um, accounting systems, reconciliations, um, you know, when you talk to any kind of aspiring chef who wants to start a restaurant, uh, these are typically not the first things that they think about. So sometimes along the way, they, you know, they, they, re they realize right, that, oh, you know, I have to look at all this. Like, okay, um, it's a lot. So I think the industry today is, is, is very, very fragmented still, where you have a product or a service that, you know, might cover one part of your requirements, but not the other. Um, so what we are doing, and more specifically in, in the food delivery kind of space, is that we're trying to help enable operators and restaurant owners uh, to, take, to take back basically um, you know, their data, um, to have more knowledge over their own operations. You know, how long does a food you know, uh, take to cook from the time the order is received to the time it goes out to the, uh, the window? Uh, so these are things that you know, we, we sometimes forget that you know, these are industry norms. Uh, these are you know, most of us who are sitting here might be very familiar with. Uh, but for someone who's aspiring to become a restaurant owner, it might not be the immediate first thing that they think about. So we try to help them. Um, and for the larger businesses and uh, enterprises, uh, we find ways as well to give them back you know, CRM, uh, again, more knowledge and data about how they use uh, ingredients, how they forecast future demand, and to enable the delivery ecosystem that a lot of them are still uh, not fully entrenched in today. Um, given that how new this in, this part of the industry is. Actually, for uh, our three panelists today, apart from, you know, all of them are, you know, uh, serving food, they are startups, you know, in the last uh, maybe maybe few months to years, they are scalable business, and actually their model they can replicate uh, in different districts and also serving the local community. And they have one more thing in common, uh, is all of them, they need to find locations. <laughs> in Hong Kong, you know, it's all about locations, no matter it's retail, it's industrial, or other spaces. So according to your experience, you know, how long did you find, you know, your first location? Matt, you have more experience because you also run uh, Maximum Concept. So maybe you can share first how long uh, would take you to find your first key location and what challenges you have? Well, um, my first location took quite a while. Um, I... Uh, I didn't actually look at lots of locations. I found the location I liked and then worked on it. But it's fate. It, it's yeah. fate. Um, <laughs> uh, but it, but it, it took about a year uh, to, from, from starting the process to actually signing the lease with Swire um, in three buildings that way. Um, and, uh, and, and in fairness to them, uh, they, they signed an 18,000 square foot location to a PowerPoint presentation and, then, and that, yeah and that and that with no track record with no with uh, and, and actually supported it as well so um, we had to go through many many hurdles mm. to 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 build that confidence but you did in it. it yeah mm. yeah so that that was a year yeah mm. to answer your question. interesting Jerome how about you I think yeah the first one also you know I was with you you know <laughs> yeah yeah for actually it's been almost a year and a half I think mm. since we spoke now so I think we also, for the first location, we took about, I would say, six to nine months, pretty much. Um, I think a lot of it was, you know, obviously understanding local regulations first, um, trying to figure out what you can do. And the challenges with the locations that we look at is typically, you know, we want to maximize the efficiency of a certain space, right? So when we look at any kind of given building and 
and location of the surrounding uh, pretty much, then we are we go into very very unique kind of challenges like you know electrical capacity, uh, size of the the, the the water pipes even. Um, we talk about electrical upgrades. Um, sometimes with building management, sometimes with uh, like people like CLP directly. Um, so I think it's it's really site specific. But I think the moment we nailed down the first one, which was in Sang Pod, uh, we had a better understanding of, you know, locally, uh, you know, certain phases, right? The newer buildings, the slightly older buildings, for example, you know, what those would kind of look like, um, where our sweet spot would kind of be, and you know, the way that we can rejuvenate or revitalize some of these uh, older spaces, I think, was also a consideration point for us. So that's where we kind of looked at, you know, this is the the kind of floor plate that we wanted. Uh, what is the minimum? requirements in terms of electrical load uh, because most of the mechanical stuff we will build it ourselves anyway uh, but at least in terms of like headroom ceiling height uh, you know ducting and where we could run them I think this were, was super critical in terms of uh, what actually worked for us yes it's uh, always a learning process right yeah, yeah. Jessica is it you're easier <laughs> I wish I can say that <laughs> um I mean, when I first started finding the first space, I didn't know as much as I know now. So it kind of, I went in like, oh yeah, like this is big enough or this, they have kind of enough electricity. But now that we're in a bigger space, you know, every single dollar in the cost side, if you don't manage it well, that that is exponential and multiple in terms of cost. So in the current space that we have now, it took me about, eight months mm -hmm. um, but until someone step in right yeah and it actually requires um, the landlords to actually support what we're doing because we went from a proof of concept and now we're trying to show what scale looks like but there's no actual like physical of what we kind of envision it to become so yeah it took eight months um, we saw like 50 places designed like 20 in terms of layout, looking at um, electricity infrastructure, working with CLP, looking at the water source, um, the loading, um, the, the height level of the building, and also which floor because of um, electricity consumption. You know, there's so many of these details as you, you know, get deeper into the business that you have to consider, and then you have to make the judgment on which one is prioritized mm -hmm. for the long term. So it's never easy finding the right place, but Hong Kong does have quite a lot of options, um, and there's a good amount of um, landlords that are supportive of new businesses that are in a more sustainable manner. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. And also, because, you know, in Hong Kong, we also want to reach, you know, net zero uh, 2050. And then, uh, of course, property sector is a part, in, very important part of it. And uh, I think, you know, your projects can also, you know, help them achieve it in some ways. So, um, in what way or how can you support, you know, this uh, carbon neutrality initiative? What part that you are playing on, uh, Matt? This is actually a major part of our strategy, um, and we're actually launching a net zero program for corporates and, and landlords, um, and they are talking to multiple different buildings at the moment about it. And um, so when, when one looks at the net zero challenge, um, what we really help with is the scope three. Um, and the major part of scope three is waste management. Um, and then also, the you have to travel down the waste generated to that point. So. If we take a building like this, um, from the landlord's perspective, we use 25% upcycled materials uh, with the first three leaf green kitchen within all of Swire properties. We went way beyond. Um, the only limitation that stopped us was actually electricity, <laughs> um, and which meant us we had to use some gas. Um, so from the landlord, and they need that to, because the remaining tenants are gonna use them in their scope three. So, so the first step is scope three for the landlord, but then we go beyond that. We also look to the tenants themselves. Um, so any meal consumed in any office falls into scope three. Any waste brought back into the office, so every single colleague who leaves the building, picks up a styrofoam container with a plastic bag and comes back to the office now falls into the responsibility of the corporate. Um, the production, the kitchen that that food is cooked in, technically falls into the scope three. Um, the production of the beef that was cooked in that kitchen technically falls into the scope three. So, so by putting kin into the building and transforming the way the building eats 
and moving a percentage of the consumption into green kitchen production onto low carbon footprint ingredients against a baseline and then delivering without using carbon using compostable packaging and our plan in the future is actually to do circular packaging so it's actually zero waste packaging all of the benefits of that can be passed back to the corporate and so the the ESG program that we're introducing is where we actually sign the corporate onto a program with us and provide them the data of the consumption of their colleagues against the baseline and therefore are able to report against that. So it, it is a major part of what we're trying to achieve with our mission and this is the crucial part of having the data and also changing the consumption pattern is but we need the stakeholders. We actually, we need the landlord to help us build our product. We need the um, corporates to help discount our product to incentivize the bottom half of their payroll to not leave the building and consume in styrofoam at 40 to $50, but to come to us and eat regenerative organic, which in fairness is not fair to ask the lower end of the payroll to do. Um, so this is where the corporate plays the role and in return gets the ESG benefits which their stakeholders and shareholders required to continue to operate in the business environment. Purple Jerome, uh, your central kitchen, yeah, actually, yeah, I can see it's quite sustainable, quite sustainable yeah, a, a lot of green stuff that you're using. Yeah, I, I think we try, um, but there's not definitely a lot more that we can still do. Um, so, you know, for example, you know, being a takeaway and delivery operation, a lot of it is, is waste packaging, right? Um, you talk about disposable packaging and, you know, we have restaurants that, that use that uh, on a daily basis. So part of it is then working with delivery companies like Food Panda, who says their own kind of sustainability uh, program. You know, how do we uh, encourage more of these uh, pickups for reusable containers, for example, that's one. Um, and secondly, how do we transit a lot more of these customers, um, our customers basically, to use um, at least you know, uh, more sustainable types of packaging materials. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a lot more that we can do here. Um, I think right now what we are uh, more focused on is you know, pulling together different partners, um, trying to convince the local restaurant operators that this is a way not just for the branding, uh, but for the environment and I think the way that we can package their branding all together, right? Um, for different types of cuisines as well. Um, you know, we don't strictly enforce today, uh, but I think going forward as well, these are in the works where, you know, we do want to achieve uh, what the Hong Kong government has also set out to do um, and plan for uh, in terms of 2020, 2030. And you know, I think it's a step-by-step -step basis and you know, it takes a bit more time to kind of educate and uh, convince people on the ground. Thank you, Jerome. Yeah, I agree that Matt, um, the uh, avoiding the food waste is very important, especially the food, you know, nowadays are so scarce and also, you know, uh, so expensive nowadays. And Jessica, I remember you use most part of your herbs and plant. I try it actually. How do you, you know, avoid the food waste? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> one is being methodical about what we put in the growing process. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when we first started out, it was a really custom growing process where, you know, a customer will come to us, this is what we want, this is what we can consume on a weekly basis, and then we grow to order of that to reduce the waste and to cut, start changing the way um, chefs think about ordering instead of you know expecting things to be there right there immediately um, they can be a bit more methodical about how they order um, so it requires a little bit pre-planning but a lot of it comes from our work to you know get things right in terms of um, you know the amount of resources that we use in terms of water in terms of growing medium in terms of electricity so in what we do the two most energy consuming aspect is the grow lights that we have and then also the cooling. So cooling is on 24 hours and with insulation we can reduce the fluctuation um, of the temperature and the humidity inside the growing space. What's actually interesting in what we do is the, the grow lights, the LED lights. So one light is maybe 20 watt and seemingly that's not a whole lot of electricity. But when you multiply by 10,000 pieces of these lights in our growing space, that really adds up. And because we have an insulated space, we can actually switch the day to evening, which is the off-peak hour. Mm -hmm. And we're actually working with CLP to 
sort of reduce the fluctuation or become one of those two, um, one of their customers that can actually consume the the energy in the non-peak hours to sort of calibrate their um, their overall usage, and we can be a a good catalyst because um, we really look at the cost of production, especially the usage of energy um, for cooling. So we would be incorporating, for example, atmospheric capture in the the climate control for cooling. And you know, to have those work, it needs to be at scale. But someone needs to sort of kickstart that process. And as a food producer locally, we can actually. Um, a catalyst for that. Great. Mm -hmm. if, if I might, like the, there's a beautiful carryover from what your question is to what to what you do. So, in order to buy locally or buy from startups that are changing the system, it normally is more expensive. Um, and 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 because the existing entrenched industrial supply chains have worked on every single cost cutting mechanism, but if we can get into a system where, and this is where the net if we actually apply a net zero strategy on a systemic citywide basis, if we can show the consumer that what you're buying is made here and, and the benefit of that, so you've chosen a low carbon option, perhaps it's an icon on the food item, um, and incentivize that. And then if corporates are helping other people have access to that, and landlords are creating venues that give people access to that, all because we want to now stop eating lettuce from Holland which makes no sense when we can grow it here, yeah. right? Um, and th and that's, so it just cascades. Yes, it all adds up. And we, every one of us, we can be part of it. Yeah. We, we play our small part every day, yeah. and someone will get benefit one day. Maybe not this generation, yeah. but will be, you know, that will be future generation to end. Well, I really hope it is this generation. I hope so, but I, I don't know how long I can last. <laughs> and also, you know, in terms of, because you guys are in the food industry, so you collect a lot of data. Uh -huh. Can you share with us um, what is the food trend that you are seeing, especially when you are serving so many customers and then, uh, Jerome, you are receiving so many orders every day. Any trends, any cuisines that you are seeing, you know, are more popular nowadays? Jerome? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether, you know, this is the, the standard for all of Hong Kong, right, given that we are a delivery operation first and foremost. Um, but I think over in Hong Kong, where we operate, uh, a lot of the cuisines, the Korean is always very popular uh, from delivery, especially for Korean fried chicken. Um, so fried chicken and pizza can kind of pretty much never go wrong. I think there's also very strong demand for local type of food. Um, so Te Dai Min is one of them. Uh, we have other types of uh, local Hong Kong cuisine as well that's done really, really well. Um, and then I think interestingly, we have also tried to experiment with our licensees, right? Basically our clients who uh, think about the way to repackage or rebrand the types of ingredients and uh, food concepts that they bring out to consumers. Given that, you know, from basically thinking about the way that you experience food uh, at a dining restaurant, you know, you go in, you know, someone brings you the menu, you sit down, you, you absorb kind of the environment and the locale, uh, and you have your dining experience, right? So I think from a delivery point of view, that experience is a little bit different, where, you know, the experience starts from the time that you open any kind of app and look at your menu on the phone. Um, you know, is the, is the menu, are the pictures enticing? Does the description accurately match what they're going to provide you? Are the prices fair? Um, and things like that, right? And it kind of ends the moment when you receive your package from your delivery rider. And, you know, along the way, that's a good 20, 30 minutes, right? As, com as opposed to, you know, in a typical restaurant where the food goes from the window to your table in, in under 10 seconds. Um, so I think we focus a lot on this part of the, the pie with our restaurants or the restaurants that we work with and, you know, try to figure out delivery friendly uh, cuisine types and menu options um, so that they're able to better serve uh, the customers. Um, so there, there really isn't a, a particular uh, trend per se, but I think we're becoming more innovative in terms of how we present and uh, package food for delivery. And it goes all the way down the packaging, right? So not just in terms of being uh, environmental friendly or sustainable in nature, uh, but the way that, you know, it doesn't affect the food quality. Um, so I think today, you know, if, if a lot of us have tried ordering like ramen, for example, there are very good ramen stores that have now separated the broth from the, the noodles so that, you know, the noodles on the way to you will not get soggy in the midst of the 20 minutes. Um, same thing for French fries, right? How do you get that crisp uh, French fry that comes to you and you don't want 
you basically don't want a soggy fry when it reaches you. Um, so we try to work with restaurants on, on things like this. Okay. So Matt, for Kin, is it the most popular, is the Japanese food still? Um, like, like the sushi, you know? Sushi is still very popular. Um, our, our best selling dish is the lobster laksa. I'm not sure if you've tried it, but uh, it's, a, it's a, made by the chef who used to be the head chef of Gaddy's, um, Chef Eddie Long. Um, uh, but w what we see is um, great food, classic food, um, street food that is that 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 has nostalgia, that really that has authenticity, has uh, is still at the end of the day what we crave day in day out. Uh, you know, innovation. We 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 do like to experience new things, but especially when it comes to lunch, we're all actually quite conservative in how we eat. Um, so. But, but in terms of um, trends, I mean, obviously a macro trend is the increase of consumption via an app. Um, and you know, I think by 2025, we'll, it's about a $150 billion industry worldwide. So the, the shift to online, which obviously supports businesses like Fresh Lane. Um, I, I, would, I would say that um, I, I'm generally of the belief that uh, there isn't a huge trend towards compostable packaging. I, I actually think that um, the we've lost five years of development through because of COVID. I think that we've brought so much plastic back into our lives and we've anesthetized ourselves to it um, that in fact, there's almost now seen a benefit to have more plastic and more wrapping and more cling film because it feels like it's hygienically safe. And, and we've actually taken a step back from compostability and, and, and all these things. I think we've actually gone the wrong way, um, which is a, a shame, perhaps a necessity. Um, but, but, but I still think that, uh, Good food is good food. I think that's the, that, is the, that is still the trend. Well, and also, um, for these few years, actually, we can see there are a lot of, you know, um, collaboration and also crossover between brands. Like, even for Invest Hong Kong, you know, apart from bringing in foreign direct investment, we also work with a lot of local restaurant groups, you know, to bring in overseas restaurants into Hong Kong. We call it business matching. But um, for you guys, you know, um, maybe there are ways for collaboration and do it together, right? Jessica, maybe you can, you know, explain a little bit about maybe you can at the hotel and then you can, you know, join match together and also uh, with Jerome, you know? Yeah. Maybe there are some areas you can explore. Yeah, I think <clears throat> from the consumer side, you know, we kind of want to eat more consciously. We want to be more methodical about where we're consuming. Um, and that's why you have, you know, Fresh Lane and um, kin to sort of be a part of that as a solution, as an option. Um, and at the end of the day, it does require all of us to come together. So I'm on the food production side, but, you know, we don't present full cooked meals. And that's kind of where, you know, Fresh Lane Jerome and Matt with kin come They can along. buy from you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's a whole circular e ecosystem that has to come together locally to make it happen. And um, but as long as there's the market demand for it, there's good reasons for us to exist. I think my wife buys her edible flyers for you at Matchley. Yeah. She probably <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. Um, today, because um, we are running out of time, um, just last question is uh, for the floor. Do you guys have any questions on the floor so that we can take? Okay, okay, sure. maybe in Asia or around the world in, in these matters that we have been, uh, that you have been discussing, do you think we are more or less on par? Are we behind uh, the likes of uh, Singapore, Shanghai, New York, London? Are we ahead? Are we behind? Thank you. Do you want to take it, Matt? Um, the difficult question to answer because we discussed many different topics. Um, um, I think if I was to go through it quickly, um, we're very much behind when it comes to mobile and mobile payments and, and fintech and finance and, and generally technology, we tend to get left behind. Um, if uh, We only have to go to China to really learn about the future of that. Um, I think when it comes to ESG and green, I would also say we are reasonably behind. Um, uh, and uh, I think that we have actually quite an advanced real estate market because it's quite condensed into companies and there's a lot of innovation 
here that I don't necessarily see in other markets. The, in, in my sense, the consumer and the demand for health and well-being and, and consumption and plant-based consumption, we're considerably behind versus, say, London and New York, but not versus Shanghai. Um, sorry, so it's sort of a, a cascade of different answers. Thank you. So um, thank you, the organizer. Thank you, Paul, for having us. And thank you, panelists, today for your precious time. And the most important, thank you to all the uh, audience, you know, online and also, you know, physically appearing, appearing here. So enjoy the day. And uh, we have next session. Also, our, our Invest Hong Kong call, uh, colleagues, Angelica, is also bringing in a few panelists talking about the retail scene. So thank you again. And then enjoy the day. See you around. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Cindy. Truly an insightful session there. Thank you so much for sharing so much on your business models. If I just